thing with us, uh, we usually make the practice of going through an entire book of the Bible one at a time, and we're right now engaged in the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament. It's actually the first book in what we call the New Testament, uh, although um, uh, it's all of God's Word. We shouldn't think when they use the word New Testament that uh, suddenly the truth has uh, appeared. It's uh, all of God's Word. Now we're in Ga- Matthew's Gospel. Uh, we're going to uh, turn to chapter 5 this morning. We're uh, in the midst of the uh, part of uh, Matthew's Gospel called the Sermon on the Mount because he was out there on the mountainside teaching his disciples and the people. And uh, the subsection of that is what we call the Beatitudes, uh, for want of a better ner- uh, word, the happiness. The happiness says, let's make it plural here. So let's listen to God's word, uh, give it our attention, our heart, and all of our thoughts. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is as far as we're going to go this morning. Let's uh, pray together. Lord, open your, uh, your word to us. Open our hearts to it, our eyes and our minds and our understanding. The Holy Spirit, take it and make it the voice of Jesus to us, which it truly is in reality and needs to be seen that way in our own hearts and lives. And uh, give us understanding and wisdom for applying it to our lives as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned we're here in the Sermon on the Mount and <clears throat> this first section which we often call the Beatitudes should be thought of as we talked about uh, last week as a a compilation of Christian character it's that which uh, you know Jesus has already told us that you're in the kingdom my kingdom is here now if you're in the kingdom kingdoms have laws they have rules they have standards they have a way to live if you want to be a fruitful member of those kingdoms and here Jesus is laying out there on the mountain what good Christian character what good citizens of his kingdom look like now we looked last week at this matter of poor in the spirit and and just to recap briefly three things first of all we decided by looking at the text that it doesn't it's not talking about just being poor There's no merit to being poor or being rich in this world. Uh, That's not what Jesus was talking about because he said poor in spirit. And as we unpack that, we we said the heart of being poor in spirit is being wholly dependent upon, upon God. Giving up our pride. Giving up our own hubris. Giving up our own ideas of what what makes success and a successful life our self-awareness, our our self-promotion, and laying that all at the feet of God and saying, I am nothing without you, oh my God. That's poor in spirit. I am wholly dependent upon you. And then we mentioned briefly, which we'll touch on again in this uh, section of our our text, that, that we are in the kingdom. The kingdom is not to be conceived of, oh, it's only something way out there, but it's something that is in operation right now, has been in operation since the time of Jesus, and will continue to be in operation uh, until he gives the kingdom up to his Father in the eternal state. So that's uh, uh, just a real brief recap of last uh, Sunday's sermon. If you want to hear it in full, the boys tell me they're getting them up on the on, on the YouTube again, so yeah, you can listen to it again. Today, we're turning our thoughts to the next happiness statement there. Uh, last week, it was happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then we're going to take up two statements here this morning. 
Happy are those, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. At, at, when you, at first blush, when you read that statement, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, it seems like a, just a crazy statement altogether. I mean, who is ever happy when they're mourning? I mean, it seems like a contradiction of terms, doesn't it? But we have to remember uh, that mourning takes different forms in the Scriptures. And it's used in different contexts besides just mourning at a death or mourning at the loss of something, uh, or, uh, you know. Now, at root, the Greek word here uh, does mean to be overtaken by grief. But it's, uh, it's interesting. It's, it's not, the thought here is not just about tears running down, as we commonly think about mourning, but it means to be overtaken by grief so that it shows. I think that's an interesting concept that you that tacks on to this Greek word for mourning here. To be overtaken by grief so that it shows, and, and it might be then fruitful for us to ask, well, what do we mourn about and how is that going to be showing in our lives? Well, the same word is uh, and concept is used over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if you want to turn there this morning. 1 Corinthians Chapter 5 and verse 2. Uh, it says there, we'll just read verse 1 to catch the context here. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of that of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. Horrible moral situation. Notice what verse 2 says then. And you are arrogant. Ought not you rather to mourn? And let him who has done this be removed from among you. So how does uh, the Apostle Paul use this same Greek word of mourning? He says he's not concerned about the tears so much or the anguish cries. He's concerned about mourning as something that is relating to sin, to sorrowing over sins. Now, when we can, th when we think of it, and bring that back to this uh, beatitude, happy are those who sorrow over their sins, because that leads to action. And uh, of course, if you read verse two there in, in 1 Corinthians five, you'll see that uh, Paul wasn't just asking them to be sorry about what this guy was doing to the congregation and to them. He says there. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this thing be removed from you. The only successful mourning about sin is when it leads to repentance. When it leads to change. That's, uh, that, that's, uh, change is, uh, that word repentance in the New Testament is a, a famous word. That means to make an about face. To have a change of mind. So when Paul was asking them to mourn over this sin, he wasn't just saying, well, don't just be sorry that the world is such a mess. Don't just be sorry that people's lives are such a mess. Don't be just so sorry that this guy's life is a mess. Do something about it. Be so sorrowful for sin that a change is brought about in life there. Uh, we re, uh, read the same uh, type of thing in 2 Corinthians. Uh, Paul picks up the, the thought again in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, verse 21. Uh, if you would like to uh, turn to there, 2 Corinthians 12, 21 says this. There, I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you, and my, I, may, I may have to mourn over those who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality they have practiced. Again, it was personal to Paul. See, this thought that sin would go unchecked, that, that, that there would be no change from this continual life of sinning. He says, that breaks my heart. That makes me worn, mourn. 
uh, same, uh, and, and, and so that you understand that, that, what was the broader context? This is the third time I'm coming to you, verse 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 1. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. This, by the way, and this is maybe a little bit of a side, but uh, I think it fits very well here with what we're reading in Matthew, is why we have church discipline in our churches. Why we don't just say, well, you know, people are just wretched. They kind of do what they do, and, and, and we don't, you know, we don't care. We, we, we can't do anything about that in the church. No, proper mourning for sin, according to the apostle, and as a fulfillment of this beatitude, this statement of happiness, means that sin will be dealt with. Now, let's apply that. It needs to first, I mean, we've talked about how this works itself out in the congregation, but of course it needs to work itself out in us first. We're never going to be truly happy in this life, living in our sins, wallowing in the wrongness of our life. We're only going to be happy when we mourn about that, when change comes, when we repent of those sins. You know, that was a, a, to come back, to jump back in Matthew a little bit, when Jesus talked about the kingdom, what was his first word there? Any kids, do you remember? He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. And now he's elaborating a little bit in this beatitude upon what that means to enter into the kingdom. You enter into the kingdom by repentance of heart, by mourning over your sins. And it's given with this promise. Back to verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And this is an interesting word. It's a famous word in Greek too, parakaleo. Some of you may have heard of that word before. It means to call someone alongside, to allow uh, to be Im to, uh, to allow to be implored. That's kind of a stilted language there. It means that when you call out, someone's going to hear. Someone's going to hear. You see, a lot of people walk through their lives. Uh, burdened down by their sins underneath that load there. And uh, they, they, because they do not mourn for their sins, they do not repent, they do not turn away from them, there's no one listening. What a ho horrible thing that is. If you're alone in this world in your sins, you're really alone. No one going to come to rescue you. But those who turn from their sins, the Bible says, seek help with God will, and repent of their sins. They will hear. They will be heard by God. See, that's the essence of this parakaleo. You will be heard by God. You'll be connected back to God. In fact, He'll come alongside of you, beloved. And that, that's sort of a, another aspect of this particular Greek word, parakaleo. It was used for lawyers. We don't always have to speak badly about lawyers. There are some good ones out there. And, and a lawyer is someone you called alongside because you don't know what to do. You find yourself in a spot and you call this, this expert in the lock to come alongside of you. But the most wonderful part of this Greek word parakaleo is that it is also used of who? Who knows? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Because that's ultimately what happens when we repent of our sins when we mourn for our sins, whether that happens to be a personal mourning and repentance or even corporately in the body, who comes to the rescue? The Spirit of the living God. The Holy Spirit descends and comes alongside of us. And the Apostle says even lives in us. Romans chapter 8. 
Why is this? See how this is such an important characteristic of us as believers? Of, uh, of, of why it would be important to, to have this if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, this holy God who rules the universe. We enter in by faith in Jesus as the repentant ones, the ones mourning for sin and the Holy Spirit is there with us all the way. Now, beloved, if that wouldn't make you happy, I don't know what would make you happy in this world. To go from being alone and under the burden of your sins to having the shining power and brightness and glory of the Holy Spirit of God living in you and giving you a new heart and taking away your sins by the blood of Christ. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. They shall be came alongside of there see that see how that fits logically with what we were talking about last week too last week we were talking about being the poor in spirit wholly dependent upon god well when we're wholly dependent upon god and we're turning away from our that means we're turning away from our sins because sin is that thing that god cannot tolerate you see and so it's, it's the next, you know, sort of logical argumentation here in what is the character of a true Christian. Someone who de- is wholly dependent upon God and is turning away from their sins to the living God and is being implored. Their, their words are ascending to heaven now. There is a real connection with the living God. Then he goes to one other thing there, and I think we have time for this this morning. We hope so. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So we have blessed are those who, who are poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, and now thirdly, blessed are the meek. Now, first of all, I think we need to define this word because, uh, you know, the present day understanding of meekness is you could almost put slash behind it weakness. This is a person, a meek person in our own present English understanding, generally speaking, is uh, they're just a milk toast. That's not even a good word. That's too old for some of you younger people. Uh, you know, they're spineless. They're, they're like a, a, a bowl of jello. You know, that's what the present conception of meekness is. But the Greek word here actually means to exercise God's strength under his control. In other words, it's, it's to demonstrate power, but without being harsh in the way you do that. That's what a truly meek person is. Someone who can demonstrate power, but in the softest sort of way there now we have come into the kingdom as as verse uh, verse uh, three has talked to us about the kingdom has come it is coming and it will come in its final form and and we have come to possess it and that's why uh, it, it's interesting there's sort of this uh, this uh, Apposition or or, or uh, placing off over against one another here in this verse. This blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And again, uh, like the last statement, it almost seems contradictory, because people who get things in this world are who they're the harsh drivers, the go getters. The ones who are willing to step on anybody to get what they want, to, to, to trash their way through family and friends and business colleagues to, to get their piece of the pie. That's, that's the typical understanding of hard-charging businessmen. They're the ones who get and everything in this world. But Jesus says that's not the reality. Blessed are the meek, 
for they shall inherit the earth. You know, we've begun to inherit the earth already because we have the kingdom. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, as I've been speaking about, the kingdom of heaven is coming, does it say? What's it say? For there is the kingdom of heaven already. The kingdom is here. Matthew chapter 19, a few chapters later, verse 26 through uh, 28 there, say, uh, or 29, say it this way. Um, Jesus looked at them and he said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or lands for my sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. We have come to a kingdom where God says I, you've inherited eternal life. And you will inherit in, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34, you're going to inherit the kingdom in its final form as well. Uh, listen to this, Matthew 25, verse 34. When the king will come to say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Uh, you, we've, we've come to inherit the kingdom. Now, what does it mean then, though, if it says we're going to inherit the earth? Okay, Matthew's been pretty clear about being a part of the kingdom thus far in his, his uh, book. But what does it mean to inherit the earth? Well, I think to understand this phrase, we have to uh, go back a little bit and think of how these, his Jewish listeners would have understood that. What was the most important thing? For the Jewish people, what was the thing they had strived for for years and years and had a little bit of and lost and then kind of got it back? It was the land, right? You know, the promised land. They were always wanting to get the promised land. And they eventually, under Joshua, did get the promised land and then they lost it and went into the Babylonian captivity and then they kind of streamed back and struggled back and lived in the land, but they were always under domination of all these people. And so for the average Jewish listener, they wanted the land in the worst way. But Jesus, when he starts talking about the kingdom, he says, look, that's not enough for you to inherit the land. You should inherit the whole earth there. And that's what it says there. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It's, an, an, it's actually a, a quite an interesting usage of the word earth here in this chapter 2 because it's, it's the word that's most commonly used for the soil. There's another word in Greek, cosmos or, or world. It's not what, what the Apostle Matthew uses. He says he uses the word earth for earth and ground and soil and land. Uh, it's same word used in the parable of the sower and the seed when, when the seed falls on the good soil. And the emphasis is not on the cosmos, the system of this world, but on the physicality of it. Now, I think that means that we need to have a little rethinking of our pessimism sometimes, beloved. You know, we live in a time where the world around us does not seem to be in very good shape. And, and uh, we've been overwhelmed in our lives, too, by systems of eschatology which... Uh, which are at their core pessimistic. It's always going to fail there. 
But is that truly the way we ought to think about the church, the, the kingdom in this world? Is it a doomed to failure organization? That's not the language of, of Jesus' parable here when he says, you shall inherit the earth. Now, that doesn't, uh, you know, I don't think that means necessarily that, that we, uh, we're all, uh, only Christians are going to own all the land of the earth here at the end of the day, and that they're going to own every factory and every house at the end of the day. But it certainly means something, beloved, grand and glorious, when you say you will inherit the earth. I think that, it's time for us to have a, what I would call, and others have maybe called this as well, a, a more a theology of victory, not a theology of pessimism. That this kingdom is going to make progress, and that the people, the, the, the people who are subjects of this kingdom, the believers, are, are going to see uh, the inheritance of the earth in a greater and greater way. Now, why do I say this? Well, let me just let some scriptures just roll over your minds here. If you want the specific references, I'll give them to you later. Daniel 7. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. And His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Revelation 17 and 18, we don't have time to read both chapters, but it talks about the overthrow of Babylon. Psalm 72, may he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. Psalm 72, Isaiah 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills. And all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that we may, he may teach us his ways, and we may walk in his paths. Daniel 2, But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And what was that about? It says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from the mountain by no human hand, and then it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A, a great God has made known to the king that this shall be, what shall be after this. The dream is certain and his interpretation true. Daniel 7. Daniel 7 again. And to him was given a dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations, all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. I could go on. Beloved, that's just a selection of verses that talk about the Lord Jesus and his kingdom. And I would submit to you, those are not pessimistic, pessimistic thoughts. So whatever view of prophecy you might take, whether you're a all mill or a post mill or, or a pre mill or a pan mill or a no mill, you don't even know what I'm talking about. It ought to at least as the believers, as the subject of this kingdom, be one that is filled with, uh, with thoughts of victory in this world. Not thoughts of defeat. How do we inherit the earth like that? Well, not by military might, 
not by ruthlessness, as Jesus has said here. We inherit it by God's strength applied in a righteous and a gentle, gentle manner. I, think of, I like to think of a, a Christian as an iron fist inside of a foam-covered glove. Beloved, we're called to be members of this kingdom and this is going to be a victorious kingdom. Now, how do we do that? Well, I don't want to get off into a completely different <laughs> text, but you read Revelation chapter 20 here and uh, I'll give you the, my, uh, the, uh, the interpretation of that one of these days here. But I believe that we are reigning with Christ now. We're in the kingdom now. That's how Matthew describes it. And we are reigning with Jesus in this kingdom. And, the, and that, that this is, by the way, not a health and wealth gospel statement because your reigning may be your suffering, as we'll see in the later part of these, these verses. It may not always be you're on the top. You may actually be on the bottom your entire life. But that, means you don't, that doesn't mean you're not reigning because... The three most significant things in this world are your sins. You've been con- they've been conquered by the Lord Jesus Christ. The flesh, which is that continual onhanging of, of your sinful nature, that has been conquered by Jesus Christ. You reign over it through the Word and the Spirit. The devil himself, who Jesus crushed his head there at the cross and says of the church, you will crush his head too. That's a reign, beloved, that everybody is involved in and everybody is, is, is to be uh, thinking about in your life. And that kind of victory in your life is what brings the power of the gospel to bear in the culture around you, in the society around you, among your neighbors and among your your friends and among the people you work with and the people you go to school with. You reign with Jesus in that way because of what he's done and because this is an eternal kingdom that you've been brought into, one that will last until the end of time. So we have to have iron in us, beloved. See? Because our lives do make a difference in this world, no matter how they may seem insignificant. Because we're reigning with Jesus over sin, the flesh, and the devil there. That is impact, beloved. That is a victorious life and leads to victory within the kingdom, though it may have its ups and downs when we look around or at it. It may seem like the church is expiring at this minute, but it's not. And when we look at the first 2,000 years since Jesus inaugurated his kingdom there, we see a steady growth of the gospel in this world. I mean, who heard of Erian Jaya or Papua New Guinea? And there's churches there. Who has heard of Tasmania? That there's churches there. Outer Mongolia. So the gospel is growing as the people of God reign in a spiritual manner with the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth i think that means that we shouldn't have a theology of pessimism about the work of god in our world but of optimism in our lives shall we pray lord we bless your name for giving us these statements of happiness we want to enter fully into them wholly dependent upon you turning from our sins and marching forward as as people who will indeed in some spiritual fashion lord inherit the very earth so we we want to be uh 
listening to your word and, and letting that reign in our thoughts and our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.